That traffic was something today. It seemed as if half the population of Portland was trying to get out at once. And you know what? It seemed like every car out there on the freeway had just one person in it. Of course, I was no different, all alone in my car, but I was in a hurry. Well, so was everyone else. And where did it get us? It got us where we were going a half hour late. The problem is simply that at rush hour, the system that is the freeways is overloaded when everybody tries to drive his own little iron cocoon. The only solutions are to put in more lanes of freeways or to bunch the people together in buses or trolleys or some form of mass transit. Well, I'm not here to preach a sermon about mass transit, but my traffic problems do have some analogs in the world of data communication. Look at it this way. With some data communications applications, you have a situation much like the freeways during off hours. There's plenty of room for traffic. That's analogous to interactive systems. Every once in a while, the operator sends a few characters to the host, or the host sends a few characters to the terminal. Most of the time, the host is just crunching numbers, or the operator is trying to figure out what to do next. On the other hand, with some other data communications applications, it's always rush hour. This is Tektronix's order processing department. Every order that comes in is entered on these terminals. Customer name, address, items ordered, ship via, credit status, the works. And that's for every order. That forms part of a database in a central computer. Elsewhere, there are more terminals keeping track of inventory and shipping and billing. That all adds up to a lot of data constantly being shuffled in and out rush hour on the data communication lines. Here's another application that involves large volumes of data being transferred back and forth. It's a remote job entry terminal, an IBM 3770. Remote job entry, or remote batch, refers to the practice of inputting and outputting large amounts of data on terminals distant from the host computer. I'm talking about really large amounts of data here, programs with reports so huge you'd never try to output them on a remote line printer. The line charges would just be too high. OK, another example might be the transfer of files from a remote mass storage device, disk or tape, to the host and back, say, for updating mailing lists and printing labels. At one time, all those input-output functions were handled only by peripherals located in the same room as the mainframe. But that's inefficient use of personnel. And for any organization that's physically spread out, the delay between the time you request processing and the time you get your results, well, it's often intolerable. Well, it became intolerable as soon as remote job entry terminals became available. No longer was it necessary to hand carry a stack of punch cards through the pouring rain to the computer center. Now you could sit safe and dry in your own building and feed the cards into remote batch terminal. But that stack of cards represents a lot of data to be sent over data communications link. So does the printout you might expect in response to that data input. Again, it's rush hour. Now there's a third situation where you have great volumes of data going back and forth between a remote device and a host computer. In this case, the remote device is like a remote batch terminal with intelligence. The key to the concept is distributed processing. The 4081 is a good example. Some of the data processing, especially the handling of graphics, takes place within the 4081. The really heavy number crunching is handled by the host computer. So the processing load is distributed between the two. The idea is to cut down on line connect charges and input output costs by collecting the data at the 4081, then sending only what the host requires as quickly as the 4081 can send it. Even the ubiquitous 4051 gets into the act. For many people, the 4051, connected as a terminal, is their first introduction to distributed processing. Now, the option one communications interface always runs asynchronous. But some tech customers have found that they need to use synchronous communication. These customers need an interface designed to send large volumes of data at high speed, if they're to beat that rush hour traffic jam. Well, what do they do? How does one get a data communication system to handle large volumes of data at high rates? Well, do you remember that 
In an earlier program in this series, we talked about the differences between asynchronous and synchronous data communication. In that difference lies the key to effective use of channel capacity. As in the 4051 with option one, asynchronous communication systems are most often used in systems such as interactive timeshare that move only small amounts of data at a, at a time. You might say that asynchronous is analogous to a freeway with one driver in each car. As you recall, each asynchronous character is packed in its own little nest of start and stop bits and sent off down the line on its own. It has no timing relationship to the characters that went before it or those that will follow after it. Now that's fine for interactive systems, but look, three out of each 11 bits in an asynchronous character carry no information. No matter what baud rate you're pushing data, 27% of your time you're not sending data. Synchronous data transmission, on the other hand, is mass transit for data, except it's more of a commuter train than a bus or trolley. We touched on synchronous in the second program in the series. We said that there were special characters at the beginning and at the end of a block of characters, and that these characters identify the beginning and end of the block. Within the block, every bit in every character is exactly in step, hence the term synchronous. Because all the bits are in step. A synchronous modem can use more efficient modulation techniques than an asynchronous modem. The result is to raise the effective data rate of a phone line. Typical speeds for synchronous lines are 2,000 to 4,800 bits per second. Now let's take a closer look at a block of typical synch synchronous data. In this example, I'll be using IBM's BSC, or Binary Synchronous Communications, but other systems are similar in concept. It's a matter of the characters you choose as control characters and the way you pack the information into blocks for transmission.